We would like to welcome everybody to our Tejas Conference, Storytelling in the Time of Corona. Welcome, welcome. And we want you to know that this uh, festival is supported by the city of Denton, Texas. So we give a big shout out to Denton, to the city of Denton. We are excited and uh, we meet our challenge of having a virtual conference and the speakers are gonna be fantastic. We are delighted to have our speaker for uh, this evening, this afternoon's workshop. Now, Dorothy Tucker loves working with kids. She has performed in schools all over the country. She portrays about 20 women from history. And today she'll show you how to portray the people who, uh, whose stories you'll tell. But first, she thought you might like to meet someone from the Revolutionary War. Let's see who this person is. Well, good afternoon to you. I I'm so delighted that you've come to visit. I, I know that you probably have read about me in the newspapers and had to see for yourself this woman who became a soldier. And I know that you probably wondered how in the world I'd ever done it. Well, I'll tell you. It started when I was a child. You see, I was born near Plymouth, Massachusetts. And my father went to sea when I was four or five years old, and he never come back. And my mother was sick most of the time, found she didn't have work enough to feed us. So we was all apprenticed out. My brothers and me was apprenticed. Uh, my brothers, rather, was apprenticed to trades, and my sisters and me apprentice to housewifery. So that's how it was I landed over in Middleborough with a family by the name of Thomas. Now, poor Mrs. Thomas had five sons, not a single daughter to help her with the housewifery. And then of all girls to get as servant, she gets me. I, I did my best, I did, in truth. But my heart was never in cooking and cleaning. What I wanted was schooling. So each day when the Thomas boys had come home from school, I'd get them to teach me a bit of what they'd been learning that day. I learned some reading and writing. I learned my numbers, and that's all served me well enough. Then we go off and do whatever boys do once they're done with their schoolwork. We go fishing and hunting and catching frogs. And well, I learned to ride and to shoot and to spit and scratch as well as any boy. And then, of course, we talk politics. Now, I'll never forget when William come home talking about uh, the, the closing of the Port of Boston. A group of fellas dress themselves up as Indians, climb on board ship, throw a bit of tea into the drink. Now, whether or not you agree with them for why they done that, it was a crime. It was destruction of private property. And they'd done it knowing full well that they'd be arrested for it. But instead of arresting them, the British closed the entire Port of Boston. No ships coming in bearing goods, no ships going out. An entire community and the surrounding countryside, the British government strangled to punish the crimes of a, of a handful of people. What had we to do with the Boston Tea Party? And that's when the fellas began signing up and there sat I in a petticoat. <laughs> I tried to content myself for a time making shirts for the soldiers, but one day I'm sitting there sewing and a thought comes to me. Deborah, I says, you're as tall as any man is. You know how to ride, you know how to shoot. Perhaps you could pass yourself off as a lad and enlist. So I went digging through the Thomas boy's clothes, found me a shirt, a pair of breeches, a waistcoat would fit. And when I looked in the glass, I near fooled myself. Huh. And then I thought, now it wouldn't do to look like a lad, but act like a girl, now would it? So I began observing how a man moves. How does he sit and walk and use his hands when he talks? And I began practicing, and it was not long after I heard there was a recruiting officer come right there to Middleborough. So I decided to try my disguise. I dressed myself up, made my way down to the center of town. But the recruiting officer was Isaac. <laughs> A childhood friend. We'd, we'd played together. Of course, he saw through me straight away. He says to me, Deborah Sampson, what on earth are you doing, girl? So I sort of slunk home with my tail between my legs. And from what I hear, they kicked me out of church the following Sunday for wearing men's clothes. But I wasn't around to know about that because my mind was fixed. And I know there was another recruiting officer over in Bellingham. That weren't but 35 miles off. So 
straight away I set off a walk-in and when I arrived there that recruiting officer was no one I'd ever laid eyes on I joined up the fourth Massachusetts regiment of foot and I was a good soldier I was one of the best I was so good they put me in the light infantry the very best the most dangerous missions and I was with those lads for about a year and a half when we was outside Terrytown, New York now there was lots of loyalists in and around Terrytown, and we was sent in to capture the ringleader of them but we was caught in an ambush and I took a deep cut to the side of my head and a bullet to my leg and they're carrying me off to the surgeon and I'm thinking now now I'll be discovered but the first thing the surgeon did was to bind up my head wound they bleed something fierce so he saw to that first and then I suppose there must have been folks that was worse hurt than a bullet to the leg for he left that part of the tent and when he did I saw on a table nearby a pile of bandages and I grabbed as many bandages as I could hold and I slid out the back of the tent right underneath the tent fabric there and there was a, a, a thicket of bushes back behind so I pulled myself far back into that thicket so as I was well hid and I took off my belt and I clenched it between my teeth to keep myself from crying out and um, <laughs> I have a bullet deep in my leg and I have nothing but my hunting knife with which to take it out but it it must needs be done so I cut in I could feel the bone and the musket ball there with the tip of the knife it makes me sick every time I talk about it I had to make the cut about so long so I could get my fingers in around that ball to get it out but it must needs be done so I did it and then I wrapped it up good with those bandages and I waited for I know an infection was like to come on me and I and it must have done so I remember nothing for quite some time but when I come to it was sore enough all right but I, I found if I had a stout enough stick I could bear a bit of weight on it so I made my way back to my regiment but now soldiering was hard after that a soldier spends all his time on his feet you see marching and digging and drilling and the wound pained me a great deal and and after a time I thought well perhaps if I was made a waiter to an officer I'd have less pain I'd be on my feet less so I requested a transfer and they give me then to General Patterson well just then General Patterson sent to Philadelphia and there's measles and smallpox both are raging in Philadelphia and I come down with the measles so bad I was delirious out of my head with fever so I could not prevent myself from being discovered but God bless Dr. Benny, he didn't go and tell everyone. He told only General Patterson. And when I was well enough to go back, he says to me, now you go on back. But you must know General Patterson knows you're a woman. And sure enough, there's a note waiting for me in my tent, Private Shirtliff, to report to General Patterson immediately. I think that's the hardest thing I've ever done. It was harder than taking out that bullet. It was harder than facing enemy fire. For all I know, he might shoot me right then and there. I, I was breaking at least two laws, what I know of. It's against the law for a woman to wear men's clothes. It's against the law for a woman to join the army. I'd done both of those. So I, I thought I was walking to my own execution. But a good soldier does what he's told to do. So I reported to his tent. I announced myself. I hear his voice from inside the tent. Come in, sir. He says, well, private, at last I know why you don't shave. He broke into a great grin. He told me I was a good soldier. He told me I was one of his best. And he was proud to have me serving under him. And if he could keep me, he would. But, of course, I being a woman, he couldn't. But he did give me an honorable discharge and a, a fine yellow gown. And the next day when he reviewed the troops, they were standing all at attention, he allowed me to walk with him arm in arm. I now dressed as a woman. And I looked every one of those lads I'd served alongside straight in the eye. Every last one of them and not a one of them knowed it was me <laughs> well 
I hope that I've answered most of the questions that compelled you to buy your tickets to this afternoon's lecture, but I am quite certain that you must have other questions. And so with that, I shall detain your questions no longer. And if there's something you should like to ask, uh, why then I encourage you to raise the blue hand and, uh, and ask me whatever questions you might about my service to our country, uh, how I hid my identity, what I've done since the war. What would you like to know? Please raise the blue hand, click the blue hand button, and I will know that you have a question. I have stunned you into silence. <laughs> Certainly, you must have some curiosity. Viveka, what would you like to know? You'll have to unmute yourself. Did you ever marry? I did. did marry? I did. I consider myself the most fortunate person in the world to, to have encountered Benjamin Gannett. You see, I don't know what I was thinking when I was first discharged. I went home to my real mother, and you remember she hadn't raised me. And uh, she was so disgusted at what I'd done, she kicked me out of the house. So I then... Uh, went back and stayed with the Thomases for a short time, but I didn't want to impose on them. And um, my, my uncle Zebulon Waters invited me to come and live with him and my aunt Waters, and I'd not been there long when they invited their friend Benjamin Gannett for supper. And uh, now you must understand, there's folks that'll cross to the other side of the road to keep from speaking to me. They're so disgusted by me. But Benjamin Gannett married me. <laughs> and together we have three children of our own and one who we adopted. And he is even more remarkable than you might imagine because now Earl, our eldest is 17 and Susanna, our, our youngest is seven. Here am I traveling around New England, renting out theaters, giving these lectures on having been a, a female soldier while my husband stays home with our children. I must be the most fortunate woman in the world to have encountered him. <laughs> you absolutely are. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I agree with you, madam, I agree. Shanti, did you have a question? Yes. Um, did your husband have a lot of questions about your service? Did it upset him that you dressed like a man? I don't think it upset him. I think it intrigued him. <laughs> uh, and of course, he wanted to know everything. He wanted to know the entire story, why I did it, how I did it. and uh, but, but he was well assured as is the truth that, uh, now there have been things written in the paper uh, saying that I had liaisons of one kind and another, and that's not true at all, because you see, I was convinced that if I were caught as a woman in the army, I would be executed. I was convinced of it, court-martialed and executed. So I went to extreme lengths to see that no one ever knew that I was actually in point of fact a woman. And uh, so my husband's fears on that account were allayed once we had discussed it in more depth, you see. Well, gentlemen, ladies, I, I suppose you must have other questions, but I do have another engagement to which I must attend. So with that, I shall thank you kindly for coming this afternoon. I hope I have answered all of your questions and I bid you good day and safe travels. <laughs> oh, if you will hold, I have someone to whom I should like to introduce you. Hello. <laughs> I'm Darcy Tucker, and um, Deborah Sampson, who you just met, was a real person, and she really did do the things that I told you that she did. Um, what is a little confusing about her is that after the war, she helped an author to write her life story, but they never knew that someday she would be in the standards of learning for many elementary school students around the country, <laughs> and so they weren't writing it Although it was called a true account, they weren't writing it to actually be a true account. They were writing a good adventure story. So there's an awful lot in the story she helped write that isn't true. And historians have spent a lot of time trying to figure out what actually did and did not happen. So what I'm going to do for you today is um, talk with you about how you can portray someone from history 
or someone from literature for that matter. Um, I'm teaching a, a, a class on this right now online and one of the people in my class recently portrayed Minerva McGonagall from the Harry Potter series. So, you know, you can pick your favorite fictitious character too. And a lot of the same principles are gonna apply. Okay, so um, I have come up with a handy dandy little acronym I always figure that it's easiest to remember something when you have an acronym um, that'll help you. And this is the acronym that I have used. And you might want to write it down. I'll also at the end give you um, links to a couple of graphic organizers. One of them is a story planner and it's aimed more at kids and new storytellers who are just figuring out the ins and outs of how to do character development and how to plan a story. The other one, um, which I'll show you, has graphic organizers for you to be able to record some information. So who knows what S in script might stand for? You can all unmute yourselves and holler out at this point. What do you think S stands for? Setting. Good idea, but no. <laughs> Storytellers. Good idea, but no. <laughs> <laughs> the story. Subject. The subject. What is the story about? And in this case, I, I portrayed Deborah Sampson, and it was sort of about Deborah Sampson, but it was also about the Revolutionary War, wasn't it? And I did a condensed version because of timing on this workshop. There's usually about twice as much, so I get into more of the, the things that happened that caused the anger among the colonists and that kind of thing. So the subject in her case is the Revolutionary War, the events that kind of led to the war, and um, everyday experiences of privates in the revolution, as well as Deborah Sampson. Some of that information I could get at using any private in the American Revolution. It doesn't have to be Deborah Sampson, right? Because it's the bigger subject matter that, that mm. I'm trying to get at. With that in mind, what do you think C might stand for? Character. Character. Character, okay. So once you know what you wanna teach, whether it is that you wanna do the old man in the sea, right? <laughs> or whether you wanna teach something from history, figure out who you could use to tell that story. And it doesn't always have to be the main character. Let's imagine for a minute that you want to do something that's about George Washington, but you don't look like George Washington. You know, what are you going to do? Who could you be? You could be one of his uh, camp aides. Uh -huh. You could be someone who served under him. You could be a relative. Uh, mm -hmm. You could be, you could be his horse. You could be <laughs> his horse. <laughs> if you wanted to be, you could. And you know, his horse might have some interesting perspectives on him, right? And being someone who is not the main character actually can be really effective because let's use George Washington as the example. He was known to be incredibly humble. And the fact is he was humble because he, he kind of had imposter syndrome. Most of the men that he rubbed el elbows with had really extensive educations, had gone to Europe on the grand tour and all this. His mother refused to let him have that education, wouldn't let him go on the grand tour. He largely educated himself. He was as educated as anybody, but because he had taught himself and tutors hadn't taught him, he felt like he wasn't quite as educated as he should be. He sort of felt like he just wasn't quite up to it. He's not going to walk in and say, hello, I'm General Washington. I led our forces to victory. I have now been chosen to be the first president of the United States. And frankly, I'm just not quite sure I'm up to the job. Right? He'd never <laughs> say that. <laughs> but his friend, Sally Fairfax, who he'd known since they were little kids, Sally Fairfax might say, you know, George Washington is the most remarkable man. I don't know anyone who is smarter than he is. I don't know anyone who's better qualified for the job, but he doesn't see himself that way. And see how much more power that statement has coming from somebody else. So don't get caught up in thinking you have to be the main character 
in order to tell the story. Sometimes it has more impact if you tell it from someone else's eyes. I remember reading a, a book when I was in high school called, called Lancelot, My Brother. And it was the story of Lancelot and Guinevere and Arthur that it was told from Lancelot's brothers or sisters, I don't know which perspective. And, and it was, I still remember reading it now. It was really powerful because it came from an outsider's perspective. Okay, moving right along. S C R. What would R be? <laughs> Research. 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 Read, 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 read as much as you can get your hands on. Um, I'm going to pull a couple of books out to show you. Um, I, since most of you are adults, I'm going to go this route. You want to have a combination of primary and secondary sources. Primary sources being stuff that was written by that person or in an official capacity like court records, church records, that kind of thing. Um, secondary sources are, you know, books written about the person later. There's this shady area, contemporary sources. Newspaper articles are contemporary sources. They're right. primary to the time. They're primary to what everybody at the time knew about that person. But if you've ever been interviewed in a paper, you know that probably the subject was misquoted, right? <laughs> so contemporary sources are somewhere in the middle. For Deborah Sampson, I used a couple of um, primary sources besides the just general kind of um, military stuff. She was a private in the revolution. So in addition to her book, I read the diaries of several other privates, not the same person, but since they're in the same job, in the same war, they're going to have similar experiences, right? And then I find the best secondary sources I can. In her case, Masquerade by Alfred Young is my go-to. And what I look for in those secondary sources is notes, tons of notes, because that tells me I don't have years to spend researching a person, but this guy did. He spent years researching, and he's going to give me the shortcuts to knowing who and what he's talking about in the notes. And an index is great because that way I can flip back and forth and keep track of the characters and who did what. Hmm. Um, I also, I sometimes go with kid books. And for kids of you who may be in the audience, there are a lot of really good kid books that you'll be able to find at the library once you're back at school. Um, and in the meantime, there are some online library apps. There's one called Libby, and there's one called Overdrive. And you can download those apps and find out what's in your public library that way. And very often, even as an adult, sometimes I start with kid books because those give me a really good, quick overview of the person's life. Okay. One last thing I'm going to tell you about the research and the reading. I take lots of notes because I am old enough now to know I may think I'm going to remember it, but I won't. <laughs> and what I often do is take notes in different colors. What I get out of Masquerade, I might put in blue. What I get out of another book, I might put in red. What I get out of another book, I might put in green. And that way later when I'm trying to remember where I read what, because sometimes authors disagree, that way at a glance I know where I got the information and can sort it out. Okay? Mm, that's great. All right, what do you think I might be? We've done subject, character, research. What do you think I might be? Interview. In Inspiration. Inspiration, <laughs> that's good. There are a lot of possibilities for I. Not interview. Well, actually, I have friends who portray living people you know, who are quite elderly mm. now, if you were going to portray someone from the civil rights movement mm. or someone um, who <clears throat> survived the Holocaust or something like that, <clears throat> interview is absolutely part of it. Yeah. But in this case, um, I was thinking I for, investigate is the research, inference, yeah. you're going to have to make some educated guesses, Ooh. invention, some stuff you're just going to have to make up. Because if any of you had asked Deborah Sampson, um, what her mother's middle name was, she probably wouldn't say, I don't know. 
And if you asked her if she had any children, she definitely wouldn't say, I don't know. So the kind of biographical stuff that we all pretty much know, I usually have it invented if I can't find it in the back of my head, just in case somebody asked the question, that I can spit something out fast and not kind of grope around and make clear I didn't know the answer. But the most important I, imagination. <clears throat> I have a, um, my process is that I outline first. You know, these are all the things I need to say. And the first couple of times I'm just making a list, I'm not worrying about what order it goes into. But then as I outline repeatedly, I get it narrowed down to this is the order that I'm going to go through. <clears throat> and then I write out the story longhand. And then I do not memorize it. I set it aside. And I write it out longhand again. And I do not memorize it. I set it aside. And then I write it out longhand again. And I set it aside. And every time I'm writing it out, I'm imagining everything I talk about. I'm imagining sights and sounds and smells and emotions and physical manifestations of emotions, hair going up on the back of your neck and, and those kinds of things. Um, so what I'm doing is creating memories. And when I start talking, I am not reciting a script. Now, I have done Revolutionary Women, Deborah Sampson's part of that show. I've done it over 500 times. So honestly, by now, Revolutionary Women is pretty much a script. But it's still never exactly the same. Every time I start doing the show, I'm actually picturing, thinking about what happened to me as Deborah Sampson and telling you what happened to me. And the beauty of it not being memorized is, you know, if a kid runs screaming through the room, if a helicopter goes overhead, if, you know, the fire alarm goes off, whatever it is, I don't have to think, what was my next line? I just think, now, what was I talking about? Oh, yeah, I was talking about when I had to take that bullet out. Right? So... I create memories and I tell it from memory and that's what makes it seem real. Mm -hmm. All right. I know I'm flying. We don't have a lot of time and I want to leave time at the end for questions. P, what would P be? I just clicked it. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> Preparation. The costuming and props have gotten much easier now that we're doing this on video. Um, I'm actually wearing jeans from the waist down right now. <laughs> you, know, you can't tell. So the lovely part about costuming is you really only have to worry about the waist up. And when we're doing it over video, you can wear polyester and zippers and all that and no one's ever going to know because they can't see as much of you. Um, I know that there are some people who don't really put a lot of time and effort into costuming and that is okay too. I happen to be, um, it's a chance for me to play dress ups. Um, I, I think if I picked another career, I might be a costume historian. So I take the costuming really, really seriously. I think that adds a lot when you're in front of a live audience too. But are any of you teachers? Because if you're teachers, okay, if you're teachers and you have set up with the kids an understanding in advance that when you put a hat on, you're in character. Mm -hmm. You know, when you put on an apron or a pair of glasses, you're in character. You don't have to have any more than one costume item. As long as your audience in advance knows that that's their visual cue. Okay. Mm -hmm. So think through how much effort you want to put into costuming. And then the other thing is I, I love clothes. I don't have a heck of a lot of money. So I go to thrift shops. Look at clothing in terms of shapes, colors, those kinds of things, and figure out how you can make little minor tweaks to something you get at a thrift shop to make it right for that time period. That means looking at a lot of images of people of your, the, of the age of your character, of the social status of your character, and that kind of thing. Lots of images, detail by detail, so that you really know what shape necklines are and how long sleeves are. But once you've got those shapes in your mind, you can find stuff at a thrift shop and make it do. Mm -hmm. All right. Props. Use them judiciously. When I perform live, Deborah Sampson has a walking stick. You know, she talks about being shot, so it helps make it seem more real. 
don't let the props take over your presentation. But if you're pretending to be someone who's working, another of the characters in that show is working in a tavern, and the whole time she's talking, she's polishing a candlestick. She only refers to it once. My husband gambled. First, it was small things like candlesticks, dishes, which goes right back to, you know, it's never the focus. But if she were to come out and say, I'm working, and she was doing nothing, that's not you know, it's going to detract from, from the performance. So make your props work for you. Don't work for your props. And rehearse. Don't we love Bluetooth? <laughs> now I can walk through the neighborhood talking to myself <laughs> and nobody thinks I'm crazy. I often interview myself. If it's a brand new character, I'll say, so Harriet Staten Blatch, what was it that made you interested in bringing working, working women into the suffrage movement? Well, I think it was conversations that I had with working women when I was in London and watching the way the British suffragists brought working women into their, okay? So if I ask myself a question, I then have to think it through and think about how I'm going to express that. And that helps me figure out what I'm gonna say when I'm in character. I literally interview myself. I throw questions at myself and challenge myself to be able to answer them, and that prepares me. All right, T, what is T? Tell what happened to you. <laughs> Tell what happened to you. Um, for some people, the hardest part is going from third person to first person. If that's really a hard leap for you to make, write it out first in third person you know she enlisted in the fourth massachusetts regiment she was shot in the leg and cut in the head and then go back through and just change it to i i enlisted in the fourth massachusetts i was shot in the leg and i was shot and uh, cut in the head it really is as simple as just changing that pronoun um just Tell the story and then drop yourself in I, I, I instead of he, 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 or she, 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 okay? And just tell what happened to you. Now, mm -hmm. I will tell you, um, depending on whether or not you decide to take questions in character, the amount of research you need to do varies. If you are not going to take questions, then, you know, and, and actually, if you're doing this for the first time, I would say don't take questions at first. Get ready to go, do your presentation, break character, hi, I'm back, it's me, what do you wanna know? And then you can answer questions out of character. That will buy you time to keep doing more study about that person so that eventually you can get to where you do take questions. You never know what your audience is gonna ask. I've had people ask, what book are you reading right now? I've had people ask, what's your favorite song? I've had people ask which politicians are in office right now. Um, I, you know, you just don't know what people are going to ask. So number one, study as much of the world that person lived in, what laws empowered or constrained them, what medical stuff was available to the average family, how did transportation work, how did people get from A to B, learn as much as you can about their world. Um, and then also be prepared to use the old college professor trick. Someone asks you a question, you don't have a clue. So you start to answer that. Oh, it's so interesting that you would ask about such and such because it makes me think of blah, -de -de blah, -de -de blah, and go off in a completely different direction and talk just long enough that they forget what their original question was. <laughs> it's beautiful. It works every time. <laughs> So, so here we go. There it is. Subject, character, research, imagination, preparation, and tell what happened. Um, there are, let's see. Can you, can y'all see the chat right now? Yes. Okay. Can you see the story planner for kids? Is that up? I don't see it on the chat. Okay. So what I'm going to do is um, I will reload the... Actually, the easiest thing to do, um, where's Janet? 
Janet, can you can you put that link sure. back up? I have a, a site called Podia. It's a it's a sales site. Um, my hang on. Do, do, do. My handouts are on my Podia site, and I'm going to copy that and put it back in there. Paste. I think it's here. The site is listed now. The site is listed? Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, if you go to that, let me quickly show you what the two handouts are. I'm going to share my screen. Oops, that's the wrong screen. <laughs> Sorry. We're going to try this one more time. Um, ask me questions while I'm trying to get the right screen up. What do you want to know? Um, and when you created your, um, what you said for your character that you just portrayed, I noticed you had a, a sort of an accent and um, the way you used language was very specific. Yeah. I'm just curious what your process was for developing that. Um, so I have, I, I worked at Colonial Williamsburg for, for um, 15 years almost before I ever wrote this play. So I've been studying the 18th century and 18th century language ways for the last um, 30 years or more now. Mm -hmm. So part of it is just familiarity with the way they spoke. But um, assuming that you're going to do a, you know, a time period, I don't know what time period you'd want to do, read as many primary sources from that time as you can, read plays, read the newspaper, read books, read magazines, mm -hmm. Goody's Ladies book, um, because that way you get a feel for the vocabulary that they're using and the sentence structure that they're using. I don't usually use an accent per se, because honestly, nobody knows what anyone sounded like before the advent of recording. Mm, mm, mm. So no matter what I do, I'm not going to actually sound accurate, right? So mm -hmm. rather than trying to fake an accent, which might be distracting, I try to fool my audience's ears in two ways. One is by the, the dialect, the, the word choice and the sentence structure. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, if I'm doing someone who is exceedingly educated, uh, of the upper levels of society, I put all of the sounds at the front of my mouth. I'm very conscious of making sure that all of the consonants are, are uh, able to be heard. Uh, and I speak perhaps more formally than I might otherwise. Mm. This isn't really an accent, but it gives an impression of someone. And I don't know if you noticed, but I automatically stand much straighter if I'm being someone of the upper levels of society. It, it simply feels more confident. Mm -hmm. If on the other hand, I'm doing someone who's of the lesser sort, someone who works for a living, I sort of run everything all together and slur a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And I don't stand quite as straight. And it's a combination of the way I sound and the posture that gives the impression of different levels of society. Mm -hmm. Can you see this story planner for kids? Is that the screen you're seeing now? Mm -hmm. Okay, so yes. this, this is the really basic, what's the story? And then you get down to who did you pick to tell the story, describe the person, get to know them really well. And this would be good if you were writing a story too. And who else is in the story and describe those people? How and why was the person involved? That's a really basic you know, storytelling that most of you probably already are familiar with. But let's look at this other one. Can you see CI Handouts for Kids, Texas? No. No. Okay. Let's try one more time. Can you see it now? Portraying a person of the past? CI yes. Handouts yes. Okay. Yes. This one. This one really walks through everything that we talked about today, gives you questions that you need to look for information for in the research if you're going to do a serious historical piece. 
Um, if you're doing a fictitious piece, you just make up the stuff that you want to fill that in. It's got information on how to design the interpretation. The character interpretation planner starts with reminding yourself, what are you really teaching? You know, why'd you pick this person? And then here are some questions about costuming to help your, train your eye to be able to see what mm. shapes people are wearing, okay? So both of these are available for you at that Podia site that's in the chat. If you click on that, you'll go to this and you'll get the script um, slideshow that I used. Okay, what other questions do you have, my friends? We have three more minutes together. Anything. <laughs> Can you can you give us um, out loud the podius because I'm not seeing it on my um, on my okay. tablet. Okay, it's https colon slash slash Darcy Tucker. That's D A R C I Tucker dot podia p o d i a dot com. Thank you. And then. It's slash Texas workshop handouts, but you can just get to, to podia.com and you'll find it there. Um, you'll also find information about, I have a book. I wrote a whole a book on how to do this, which I'll show you. It walks you through the whole process. Um, oh, you can get wow. that on the Podia site. Um, uh. I have... I have uh, four week workshops where you by the end actually can create a character and that's on the Podia site, although I probably won't do another one till first of next year, but you can poke around. So anything else you want to know? Yes, Darcy, what, what type research or do you follow the same method if you are developed? This is Viveka. I'm oh, sorry. hi Viveka. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> um, if you're doing a story about a not so famous person, uh, maybe a childhood friend or yeah, you know, that just meant a lot to you, uh, do you go through the same script and through the same, in particular, the research portion of it? Um, do you still go through the same level of research or how do you do that? Uh, yes, um, because I almost always, it's extremely rare for me to create a character that's not intended to be used in schools to help meet the standards of learning. So a lot of the characters I do were not famous people, but they help to, um, they help to, to teach something. So I still go through the same process with them um, because it, they're usually part of teaching about a bigger issue. Now that depends on what you're going to do with it, Viveka. If, if it's just a story for the sake of, of entertainment, um, then you might work through as much as you want to just to help you get a grasp on what the story is. But it's not going to be as critical that you get every single detail correct if, if the purpose is, is to have fun rather than to actually teach serious history. Does that make sense? Right. Yes. So I could lean, uh, in that case, I could lean more on the imagination side than the research side. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. But I, it has occurred to me, if I was ever going to write um, even a work of fiction, if I was going to write a, a children's novel, for example, I might still go through and, and kind of fill out that biographical information just so that I have a really well-rounded picture of the character's backstories. I don't think it could hurt. Um, it may be too much work <laughs> to do. You may not need to. Um, but that is, if you really want to understand your character's backstory in, in theater or in writing a novel or whatever, it couldn't hurt to, to fabricate all that information that creates the backstory for the person's life. I can see that. That would, that would factor into the way they responded to other characters if there were others in the story. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. All righty, my friends, our time together has come to a close. I'm going to um, put in my email address. I am Darcy at AmericanLives.net. And if you have any other questions, you want to get in touch, whatever, feel free to drop me an email. 
And with that, I am going to throw it back to Jackie, who has a couple of things to tell you before you go. So thank you, thank you, thank you for coming. Thank and you. Jackie, take it away. Thank you, Darcy. Such good information. We are so happy you were here. Uh, everybody give her a thumbs up. She can see you. <laughs> Um, I don't know if you have another second, but somebody had asked, did, uh, did she end up getting a pension since she got an honorable discharge? She did, actually. Um, and that was one of the really amazing things. She, she had committed crimes. She should have been court-martialed, but instead she, she got an honorable discharge, which meant she got a pension. She got one from Massachusetts that came within her lifetime. Um, Paul Revere helped make that happen, and he fought with the U.S. Congress until she finally also got a, um, a pension from the United States, too. It was posthumous. So her husband was the first man in American history to get survivor's benefits. <laughs> oh, oh, my goodness. That is so cool. Yeah. <laughs> well, again, thank you. It's been marvelous. Yeah. Uh, we've learned a lot. Thanks. Did you see some more questions? And she's going to put her email in the chat? Yes. Yeah, I did already. I thought. I didn't see it come up. Darcy at AmericanLives.net. Oh, that, I sent it to everyone in the waiting room. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I'm not seeing A's. Just send it to everyone. So Darcy, D-A-R-C-I at AmericanLives.net. Awesome. And Janet, I see your message. I am trying to find you. <laughs> <laughs> so that I can return you to moderator. <laughs> well, after this, people, please join us in social hour. We have a little social event hosted by uh, Elizabeth Ellis. And after that, we'll have our evening concert. It's at six. So uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Shoot Darcy a note if you have any questions. I did type it in too. Darcy at AmericanLives.net. Good, thank you. Uh huh. And uh, it's been a joy. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye.